let's let's go. Uh, so first of all, uh, good afternoon, and it is my pleasure to moderate this last this session, the last session of the day, which will be dedicated to European security, and in particular on the uh, EU strategic uh, compass and the NATO concept, with a view to reflect on the future of European security policy. Before I introduce our uh, stellar panel of uh, experts and politicians, I uh, ask the organizers to uh, launch the video recorded by Minister Clement Bon for the occasion. Digitalisierung, la protection environnementale. Europas Zukunft. Migration. La souveraineté européenne. Wirtschaft. Nous sommes d'accord, l'Europe est face à de nombreux défis. Pour obtenir des résultats, il est essentiel de communiquer ouvertement et d'être à l'écoute. Pour cela, nous avons créé une plateforme, le dialogue franco-allemand. Diese Gesprächsreihe flankiert die Vorhaben des Vertrags von Aachen und soll den Zusammenhalt stärken. Das ist uns wichtig, denn wir an der Heddy School setzen uns ein für Multilateralismus und Kooperation. Ce qui fait la force et la spécificité de la relation franco-allemande, c'est le fait qu'elle repose sur un dialogue quotidien qui porte sur tous les sujets. Der souveräne Nationalstaat darf nicht verschwinden, aber wir dürfen Europa auch nicht verschwinden lassen. Gemeinsam müssen wir die Probleme lösen, nicht durch eine Abschottung von Europa und von der offenen Gesellschaft. Die deutsch-französischen Zukunftsgespräche sind eine Eventreihe mit drei Formaten. Beim Sicherheitsforum geht es um Kooperation in der Außen- und Sicherheitspolitik. Bei Wissenschaftspolitik schaffen wir Synergien und verknüpfen Wissen. Und die zweitägigen Pariser Platzgespräche bieten den Rahmen für intensiven inhaltlichen Austausch. Auch mit Ihnen. Wir freuen uns, wenn Sie dabei sind. Madam Minister, dear Anna Luhrmann, Madam President, dear Cornelia Wall, Professor, dear Christian Leclerc, I'm very happy to address you even by video for this important event that you're, you're hosting, which is hosted by the Jacques Delors Center and the Hertie School and signed the Sciences Po. I would like to first pay special respect to Henrik Enderlein, who has inspired many of our conversations today. We also created a prize in his memory, which rewards a researcher in cooperation with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So two laureates have been um, awarded this year um, who engaged in public debate while continuing to conduct in-depth research that sheds light on our commitments and ideas. So your conference on European sovereignty is essential. It is a notion until a few years ago was a rare, was quite rare in the, in the debate so it has been much defended on the french side by the president of the republic emmanuel macron's life also tried to promote it for more than five years and today in my capacity as minister because i think we need to question this idea of sovereignty in its most basic sense so it is a capacity for action a capacity to defend its values and interests as a political community in the world the franco-german perspective on this notion are enriching because we do not have the same relationship to power because of our history our geography our political culture we do not have the same relationship to europe and its construction but we are actually facing the same challenges and what we see is that what presided over this notion of European sovereignty is that none of the major challenges that our citizens are pressing are pressing us to face is actually the or mostly it is all about the question of climate, energy, ecological transition, question of regulation and digital world, our security, our common defense, question of food production today, and the questions of migration, for instance. On all of these challenges which are partly beyond Europe's control, we need joint action on all of these challenges and we have no choice but to reinvent our modes of action and to react at least in a partly collective endeavor, including on issues on which we could have not imagined that we would have to act together in France and Germany or at the European level. I'm of course thinking of the COVID crisis, the health crisis that hit us and we bought our vaccines together in a joint effort. It was an innovative approach, a form of applied European sovereignty that we would build just in a few weeks. We now need to explore this notion. It raises many questions, sometimes around sometimes critical, some 
sometimes simple questions, what sovereignty is actually applied to in a political entity such as Europe, which is not based on a single people, a single notion, a single country. With a fruitful confrontation of ideas between France and Germany, we have the opportunity to enrich our thinking because our relationship to the state is not the same. Uh, modes of political organization are different and we need a common perspective. We need at a time when war is once again being waged on our country, to re-examine all these notions. With the Treaty of Aachen, we wanted to promote university cooperation, economic cooperation, cross-border cooperation, and our Franco-German ties. So I know that this conference will contribute to all of these ideas and debates and that we will come out with a more enlightened, more intelligent and different perspectives. Thank you very much for organizing this conference. I would like to pay tribute to all of those who made it possible and uh, who keep this spirit alive. I would like to pay tribute once again to the spirit of Henrik Enderlein, who enlightens us as Europeans, as a citizen of Europe, as a German, loving friend, the French, and committed to this project. We are today here, the heirs of him, and we will be worthy of it. And I hope that today's conference will be a major part of promoting the European spirit. Well, very good. So uh, we have heard a few introductory remarks by Minister Bonn talking about uh, strategic autonomy, strategic sovereignty, and the role of the Franco-German duo in the uh, construction of this strategic autonomy within the European Union. In this session, we will try to go deeper in one of the sectors, maybe the core of the uh, concept of strategic autonomy, which is the field of security and defense. This is, a, of course, a particular particularly timing uh, uh, occasion to discuss about uh, these issues and the role that France and Germany can play together to build the future of European security. We know that a uh, strategic compass, a new strategic document for the European Union has been adopted uh, recently. However, uh, it was born already updated for, outdated for uh, some respects because it didn't, doesn't address really some of the core issues that the European Union is facing concerning the current security crisis uh, erupted after the Russian aggression to Ukraine, uh, which is projecting a deterrence power by the European Union and also being able to intervene uh, concretely in a conflict and crisis around the uh, European borders. But we will discuss this later. Uh, in the meantime, this week, we have the NATO summit where a new strategic concept uh, will be adopted. And overall, we're struggling still to define the future of the security architecture for Europe and uh, transatlantic uh, security. So today, we will try to address these issues together with our speakers. Uh, which I introduce immediately. Uh, first of all, Serap Güller, who is member of the German Bundesbank, Bundestag, a member of the Defense Committee. Wolfgang Ischinger, senior professor at Hertie School, among many other things. And Marie Mendras, professor at St. Po. So welcome, uh, everybody. Uh, Actually, we will start with a very interactive uh, session and uh, all the participants can already uh, put forward questions in the chat. So do not hesitate to, to write your questions uh, as soon as you hear uh, the first remarks by our speakers. To start with, I would like to ask to our speakers to uh, address the issue of how the security perceptions in their respective countries have changed following the uh, Russian aggression to Ukraine and how this has impacted on the uh, security policies of uh, France and Germany. So we will start from here to understand where we uh, uh, come from uh, when we talk the future of, of European security and defense. I will ask Serap Güller to start and if you can stay in between uh, three and five minutes, that would be great. So we can uh, uh, continue with our conversation. Uh, please, Serap Güller, the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for this opportunity. So let's talk about the particular situation in Germany since February 24th just like the federal chancellor has pointed out several times this has actually ushered us into a new era he called it a zeitenwende 
Germany felt secure for it for too long, as opposed to our neighboring countries. They have never actually felt that safe and as secure as we have felt in Germany in the past decades. Of course, this has led to a change. I believe the most prominent example for this change is the special budget for the military in Germany. It's 100 million euros. And I don't know, six months ago, if we were to, to adopt this special budget, then I don't think we would have had a majority for this special budget. As I said, this is most prominent example for the change in the security policy in Germany. This shift has happened in favor of our federal arms or in terms of our military. But I don't think that the current status of our military is going to remain as or going to be set in the very same peaceful status that it has been set in in the past 30 years. So there is going to be a change and there was a change in mindset also. So as I said, the majority of the federal parliament in Germany has voted for this special budget. There was little debate amongst the citizens to invest this money. Otherwise, of course, there are some critical voices. But as I said, if we had adopted it six months ago, a year ago, there would have been much more controversy about it. In the last years, we talked about, or we had heated discussions on increasing our military budget. There were many arguments against increasing our military budget, and I believe this special budget that was adopted is the most prominent example for the shift with regard to the mindset in Germany. This is a clear signal from the parliament, and it was there was just little debate amongst our citizens against this special budget. Thank you so much for these uh, first remarks. And of course, this uh, historic decision by the German government is something we take note of. And also something it is looked at by other European countries with a lot of interest also concerning the practical application of the additional budget and what this will mean for European security overall. I turn now to Wolfgang Ischinger. Uh, to also hear his point of view about this uh, change in German security policy and perception. Please welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Nicoletta. It's a, a privilege to participate in this in this discussion uh, with uh, 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 these uh, uh, other panelists. Um, I I want to start by saying that I have uh, nothing to. Uh, correct or, 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 or to criticize uh, listening to Sarah Buller's uh, comments. I, I fully agree with that presentation and analysis. But let me take a step back and, uh, and add just a couple of comments. First, in order to understand what has happened to the Germans, one needs to understand that when Germany became reunited on the 3rd of October of 1990, the Germans who had been a country that was against the status quo of the European security order, because we were divided and we wanted, we wanted to overcome the division. And so on October the 3rd, 1990, Germany changed from a non-status quo country to being, to starting a love affair with the status quo. And we engaged in such a hot love affair with the status quo that we were unable to understand uh, when 2007 Putin made his famous speech in my conference in Munich, when in 2008 uh, the war with uh, Georgia was started, and even when in 2014 Crimea was annexed. We thought that we could simply continue the love affair with the status quo. So it took a major shock for 
mainstream German opinion and government decision making, as Sarah uh, Güler has just pointed out, um, to wake us up, to wake us from this sleepwalking love affair with the status quo, and to make us understand that things outside of Germany were changing in such a rapid speed uh, that it uh, was almost impossible for us to catch up. Here we are. This is why this famous Sondervermögen needed to be decided by and approved by, by the Bundestag in order to, to, to do a major repair job to our defense uh, uh, arrangements and, ca and capabilities, which had been neglected over more than, over practically two decades or more. Uh, that's my fir the first point I wanted to make. So the second point is that now that we've waken up, woken up from this former love affair, uh, we are still in a process where I think many of my own countrymen, and I would also say many other Europeans, have not yet fully begun to understand the full dimension of this, what we call Zeitenwende, this uh, watershed moment in uh, the history of European security. Uh, this uh, 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 epochal uh, change. The, uh, it was the Munich Security Conference, by the way, which published two years ago, in October of 2020, um, a study titled Zeitenwende. And I'm, I continue to be proud of the fact that Olaf Scholz used exactly that term to describe the need to react and, and, to, and to do something. Third point I want to make is uh, responding to your original question, Nicoletta, namely how has this, uh, this shock of the Russian uh, unprovoked war in, in and with Ukraine, how has this affected our nations and, and our security policies? Um, the Munich Security Conference has just put out uh, yet another study called uh, Zeitenwende for the G7. And, and one of the results is based on polling uh, done among the G7 nations. And it, it's quite interesting that all of these nations, uh, of course, regard the invasion of Ukraine as a turning point in world politics. Uh, in Canada, that is about 60% of the population in the UK, that is about 62% of the population. In France, it's 64%. And in Germany, it is 70%. So in other words, for the Germans, the Zeitenwende, the shock, the, uh, the watershed moment uh, is being understood as, as being even more dramatic than in our partner countries. And that, in my view, follows almost automatically from what I tried to say earlier, from our earlier uh, happiness with the status quo, where we thought we're only surrounded by friends now since unification happened. Even Poland, our our former enemies, Poland, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, are now our EU and NATO partners. So why do we need an army? Um, so the 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 impact of the Ukraine war has been that would be my point or my response to your initial question has been more dramatic in Germany than than elsewhere. The question is, how sustainable will it be? Uh, uh, are we good for the long haul? Or is this only a kind of a, a, a quick reaction, a quick alert reaction uh, to this uh, Russian aggression? I hope very much that in our cooperation with our partners, especially with France and others uh, in the EU and in NATO, we can turn this into a long-term uh, effort to uh, in, to to enable the European Union um, to exercise, um, as Emmanuel Macron would say, uh, our sovereignty, our autonomy, uh, which we deserve to have, and to protect our nations and and our borders in a way that is truly effective, as countries like Russia have decided to ignore international law and the principles of European security in a, in a rather brutal way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wolfgang. I think you introduced two very important elements. One, the 
trauma that is somehow behind this change in Germany's uh, security and defense policy. And on the other side, also the question about sustainability of the change we're experiencing in Germany, but also other countries in uh, the European Union. I turn now to Marine Andras. So Marie, what is happening in France? And I mean, has this change in perception maybe uh, affected also the, the, the discussion and the debate leading to the uh, recent elections in France? Please. Thank you, uh, Nicoletta. And thank you to the uh, Jacques Delors Harty School and Sciences Po friends and, and colleagues. I think it's a very important discussion. And I hope this is not the last of our sessions together. Um, briefly on France. Well, Emmanuel Macron said it very clearly. We did not realize the fragility of peace. And I think this is shared by you know, every European uh, government, even I would say European uh, national army, uh, except for the Baltic states, Poland, um, you know, and a few other countries that always knew better. So yes, the shock has been huge uh, because our political elites, our industrial elites and lobbies and uh, just did not want uh, to take seriously the Putin threat. It's a Putin threat, it's a dictator's threat, more than a Russian threat in the sense of a big country or a population that would want to, to go to war. Um, we are in a perfect storm, uh, all Europeans, uh, and I would say even with our Atlantic uh, allies, because all our conceptions and consequently our practice of security, um, you know, they, they, they've blown off. They, they were not working. And I must say, we researchers, scholars, um, analysts, you know, we were warning that we were still um, thinking, uh, you know, from the old box. And we were not prepared for more conflicts because this is not the first Putin war. It's a fifth Putin war. Uh, so uh, we are in, 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 in a big storm, I think, all of us in Europe. And the very good news is that we respond together. Uh, and, and this is extraordinarily positive. And that, once again, was not anticipated by the Kremlin. Because in a dictatorship, people don't think, they don't listen to critical uh, analysis and they make big mistakes and Putin and, he, and his men are, have been making big mistakes. Longer term, we'll, we'll, we'll see that. Um, I think uh, in the case of France, um, I, I am less candid than um, some of my French friends here about the fact that we'll manage with um, the new uh, political geography and the new uh, National Assembly. Um, 89 deputies from the National Rassemblement, you know, which is really the Front National of the, uh, 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 of the old days, of the um, um, old days. Um, this is absolutely huge. I'd like to remind everybody that in April, 55% of the French who went to the polls gave their ballot to a politician who was very indulgent to Vladimir Putin uh, and to um, autocracies on the left and, um, and, and on the right. So um, the war, of course, has managed to mm, in a way to rally um, political forces, to rally the public opinion. And that's very important. You know, the French are you know, massively uh, pro-Ukrainian and, um, and anti-war, anti-dictatorship. Uh, but I am not sure um, that um, Emmanuel Macron uh, can uh, easily um, 
steer a very new strategy of security for France and for the EU and for NATO, given the constraints uh, you know, amongst uh, political uh, elite. And um, I'm just afraid that just beyond the emergency of war, the Euroscepticism, the anti-US, anti-NATO sentiments may remain, uh, remain strong. Uh, I would just like to open, I hope, the discussion that we're going to have in the next few minutes uh, about, um, uh, about sovereignty and security. Um, European, the question of sovereignty is, is, is already over. You know, we are beyond this because of this war. Uh, and, and, and that's going to last. I mean, all our discussions about European sovereignty, and now the key question is the security, not only of Europe, but of all peoples and nations, institutions, um, economies in on the continent that are, uh, and, and beyond the continent, that are being directly threatened by Putin's horrific horrific war. So um, the, the question of how we define security, how we define security, we need new definitions of security and new policies, and I hope we come to discuss this um, later today. Thank you, Marie, for introducing also the um, focus of our conversation in the next round of questions. And of course, you raised an important issue about uh, uh, the possibility to make uh, the public opinion, but also the political landscape in France, um, agree on a series of changes for uh, fr French security policy. And this is also a concern for other countries in Europe uh, about the role that France could play in such a situation in the integration process and specifically in the field of security and defense in Europe. I will take it from here to ask you a second question before opening the um, panel to uh, questions from the public about how you see progress in European common security and defense policy, also in view of the recent update of strategic concepts, both in the European Union and NATO, and how do you think this can have an impact on the European pillar in the uh, transatlantic alliance? I will start again with uh, Seraf Gule uh, for this, and again, if you can be short, then I will uh, uh, ask people to come in with questions. Please, yeah. Seraf. Yes, I'm happy to comment. I hope you can still see me. My connection isn't that stable. But in answering this question, I would like to get into what has been said earlier and what has also been underscored by Mr. Ischinger. We are witnessing an epochal transformation. I hope that... It this message had, has not only been received in other countries, but also with political decision makers and NATO representatives. European sovereignty that has already been invoked was not only something that was important during the COVID pandemic, but now if we talk about defense policy and things that are increasingly relevant on the European agenda. Let me start with something that at the latest since February 24th, we have been forced to acknowledge, namely that our security cannot be guaranteed by the United States forever. This has been common practice since the end of the Second World War. In the medium and the long term, the United States will increasingly focus on the Asia Pacific area. So we need to take charge of our own security. This does by no means mean moving away from NATO, but increasing 
focus on this European pillar. This can only be successful if we as Europeans work together in the structures of NATO, but also within the EU's common uh, defense and security policy. Being in charge of defending one's own security needs to be the focus that we have to follow, but also coordinate with our American partners. Without them, let's be honest, we won't be able to defend ourselves in the EU, and we don't want to either. If we look at the developments in NATO, the expansion of NATO, so if, for example, Sweden and Finland accede to NATO, this not only strengthens the alliance, not only strengthens NATO, but also our defense in the EU. Once these countries are really integrated in NATO, the north of Europe will also be receiving better security. We need to make common investments in our defense strategy in order to meet the United States as equal partners on an equal footing so that we can be partners that we that, that can be relied on. The war in Ukraine has showed us that in the, in the EU, the members of the U European Union play an important part in guaranteeing the defense of Ukraine. And you have seen that some your member states are more dependable than Germany. We are witnessing this and we need to close ranks, really. I want to invoke an example of what a future common security and defense policy must mean. We have more than 160 arms systems in Europe. I think in the United States, they only have 30 to 35 systems. So this goes to show that if we follow a common security architecture and security policy, we also need to talk about common systems. I'm talking about FCAS, for example, which is a very seminal system and is and there's a lot of discussion about this, which I'm following with concern and which should be followed with concern. So these common elements not only need to be underscored, but they also need to be lived because the common elements also need to be fleshed out. I think there will be further examples that we can bring up during discussion, but this is just uh, my interpretation of the whole context. Thank you so much, Setup. So I turn to Wolfgang. So Wolfgang, what do you think? Do you think this crisis has uh, led to a uh, rapprochement between uh, the United States and Europe in the field of uh, security and defense? Or do you see some competing interests at play also in this crisis that can affect uh, the relationship in the medium term? I think we can be extremely happy about the fact that we have um, a, a gentleman by the name of Joe Biden in the White House. Um, I would have sleepless nights uh, this year, this month, if uh, we had to deal with Donald Trump in this, uh, in this almost existential crisis of European security. So I want to underline what um, uh, Sarah Puller just said. Uh, let me very briefly make two or three points. First, uh, we cannot protect our own countries without the assistance, the support, the help of the United States. Nothing has changed so far. Uh, the problem is uh, the guarantee that the United States will stand by us always has been shattered, has been put in question during the Trump years. And this is why we in Europe need to ask ourselves the question, is there something we can do to make the uh, farmer in Idaho believe that it is a meaningful investment for the United States to keep supporting the Europeans. And I think the first answer to this is for us to demonstrate that we are not, as the Germans would say, Trittbrettfahrer, that we are not, you know, uh, 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 riding the bus without buying a ticket, that we are actually doing more for our own defense capabilities. That's what the Sondervermögen decision in, in Germany uh, uh, is all about. And that is what I hope 
we as members of the European Union will continue um, uh, to, 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 to try to produce. Second, second point is if we do not try to introduce, and I know this is difficult and I know it's painful, if we do not try to overcome the, the veto power of each and every single member of the European Union in the decision-making process on foreign policy and, and certainly, of course, on security and defense, we will never be taken seriously, uh, certainly not by a, a certain uh, Mr. Putin. In other words, the decision-making arrangements in the European Union need to be adapted at a time of great power rivalries and a world that's become really dangerous. And the third point is the one that Sarah already mentioned. Uh, look, if the European Union did one thing that would change our financial, budgetary, et cetera, uh, 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 defense situation, it would be, you know, not for each and every small European country to buy 12 F-35s or F-15s in Washington, but to go to Washington together as the EU and buy 200 of them at a sale price and have them maintenance and have them and have the pilots uh, trained uh, you know together we would in one stroke increase our effectiveness who would be able to use our budget for more uh, uh, fighting capacity for more more real defense capacity we could do a huge uh, but do, uh, obtain huge benefits for the, uh, the European defense effort if we did more of what we call pooling and sharing. This is actually much less difficult than you would think. What it takes, and that's my last point, is leadership. And uh, uh, the word FCAS was mentioned, a, a, an important Franco-German project. Without Emmanuel Macron and um, Olaf Scholz, uh, considering this a Chefsache, in other words, something for them to lead, you know, this, uh, these things will always keep running into major difficulties. Airbus as a project would not have taken off 50 years ago if the French president and the German chancellor and others had not considered it their personal responsibility to make it happen. And it did happen. So it's possible to do it, but it takes leadership. Thanks. Thank you, Wolfgang. So, Marie, um, what do you think? Has this crisis somehow fundamentally challenged the concept of uh, strategic autonomy and connected to the concept of NATO's brain death, as it was underlined by President Macron a few months ago? Or we're just, uh, you know, witnessing something different? Yeah. Um, well, you know, I, I spoke of a perfect storm. So, yes, everything now is, 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 has changed. Everything has changed. Every concept, every uh, rapport de force. And, um, uh, you know, I, I fully agree with, with uh, Wolfgang Ischiger in that we have to work together, but also be capable of anticipating crises and wars. And, you know, we have to be much, much more inventive and courageous in, in facing uh, the new realities. Um, and and you, you mentioned um, you know, the Trump administration. I mean, that was one big elephant in the room today, but the second big elephant uh, is Brexit, which had a huge impact also on EU, EU um, you know, uh, um, uh, autonomy, EU, um, uh, I, I mean, the, the, the very concept of, um, of EU construction and, 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 and possible uh, and, enlargement. And the, the war in Ukraine has, you know, pushed that um, aside, which in a way is a good thing that we realise that threats are very much there and they can be in every uh, national uh, state in Europe. So each one of us has to be extremely attentive and be better uh, at um, steering, you know, political lives, social and um, economic uh, policies. Now, three points very quickly is that I think that the, the new concept of security is just for everybody to see. Uh, the problem is that 
we don't need autonomy uh, from, I mean, do we need autonomy from the US? No, of course we don't. What we need is security and organization against threats. And we have the old traditional threats, like you know, the Russian invasion of a European state neighbor to the EU and NATO. And we have the new threats, you know, migrations, uh, 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 climate, um, uh, uh, subversion, uh, fake, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so uh, wh what we are now dealing with is a new concept of European security where there can be no gray zone because what is killing Ukrainians today and uh, is the fact that we accepted a gray zone of very weak sovereignty for the states in between, Belarus, Georgia, uh, Moldova, uh, Armenia, and um, I, I just hope we put it in writing that this is the end of it. We don't have a neighborhood. We cannot have a neighborhood that is shared by a country like Russia or another non-democratic uh, um, uh, country and regime. What is interesting is that the fact that we are at long last understanding that we cannot admit uh, a Russian sphere of influence, because this is extremely dangerous, not only to the Ukrainians, Belarusians, but also to us. But it's also to understand the good news is that Moscow has lost its sphere of influence. It has lost the Belarusian, the Ukrainian, the Moldovan, the Georgian. They all want to join the European uh, 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 world. So this is very important. We have to continue. The second point quickly, is um, the matter of emergency. Uh, what is most urgent? When I listen to our fellow economists and um, earlier, the, the problem today is that everything is urgent, but some things are more urgent than the others. So the war in Ukraine and the security of people in Ukraine and in Moldova and elsewhere uh, is, is certainly more urgent than the, the climate or maybe even the, the, the energy issue. So where we have to innovate and learn how to be more agile is to have a strategy in Europe and in NATO where we have very short-term uh, policies, medium-term and long-term policies. And this is the only way that we, can, we will be able to talk about a European and a Western uh, security strategy. Uh, and my last point will be um, that all in all, even given the fragilities of each one of our political societies and, and economies and energy dependence, uh, I think we are now clearly in an era of post-national uh, European security policies. Uh, I think the war in Ukraine has um, uh, you know, been the final blow to what we call in French, you know, the souverainist, souverainist in the sense that we, uh, you know, the, 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 the state, the national state always has to come first in its interest and also in the way that it divides its policies. So in that sense, um, I think it's, it's, it's all good news. Thank you, Marie. So I would like to take a few questions that we receive on our chat and uh, feel free to pick up those that are directly addressed to you or some that you're interested in. So first of all, uh, by Thomas Schneider, he has what should be the guiding principles for the European Union in the short and medium term when dealing with Russia and its presidents. So, Marie, you started already to address this, but maybe if you want to complement. Second question, uh, aside from Russia, to what extent to, could uh, France and Germany build up higher strategic convergence and analysis towards big powers like the US and China from an anonymous uh, participant. And finally, on Brexit, addressed to Marie, 
PM Johnson says that he was a can employed by the Russians to destabilize Western democracies. Would you agree with this analysis by Harry Rees? So Maria, I don't know if you, if you would like to start and if you can be as short and direct as possible mm -hmm. so we can close on time. Uh, uh, yes, I will try, Nicoletta. Uh, thank you for the questions. Um, uh, I think what, you know, when it comes to Brexit and Trump, um, Vladimir Putin has been extremely lucky you know, from the day he came to power in 99 and um, you know, with 9-11 um, uh, uh, um, and um, the American president telling him that, yes, he finally understood why um, uh, the, the, the Russians were uh, destroying Chechnya because um, it was a heaven for terrorists and to, you know, then um, uh, the, the financial uh, a, a crisis of 08. And so it, it's been, um, uh, it, I, I think uh, fr from what I can guess, um, the, the, the Russian uh, services and intelligence, you know, they, they didn't have a big plan about subverting uh, the big American democracy or uh, the, 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 the British democracy. They've always been using the fragilities, but it worked much, much better than they had ever expected. And the problem was that it gave them... Um, just big, big um, uh, ambitions to go ahead and continue with other countries, which probably explains why the Putin uh, circle of leaders um, just had, had, had no uh, uh, good sense and no uh, uh, good information about what was really happening in our countries and, and went, um, and went for, for, for this war. What is ironic is that um, the, the United Kingdom is playing a leading role in um, uh, fighting back uh, Russia and supporting Ukraine. And I think the relations with, um, with the EU in defense and security policies will continue uh, to, be, uh, to, to be very good. About um, what we can do in terms of better convergence and uh, you know strategic perceptions, everything that has been said this afternoon, I think about the Franco-German uh, special relationship, um, and also the very special role that the Eastern European countries and the Baltic states have played the very beginning of the war and before that, I think we have all the elements on the table to build a much smarter European Union when um, we just talk uh, on a par to um, the, 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 the new member states of the EU and the old uh, membership, member states um, uh, of, um, of the EU. And if I may, just one element that I find a little One minute, maybe. <laughs> yeah, it was earlier, it was earlier when we had the um, economic uh, panel. Um, I think th 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 there was a moment when, you know, sanctions were sort of criticized, you know, they don't work because prices of oil is going up. And um, I mean, sanctions have been a fantastic tool ever since 2014, because sanctions do not seek to immediately change uh, the economic uh, balance uh, or to, to starve you know, the Russian budget uh, from uh, um, it, its um, um, revenues. What it does is to um, strike at the elites inside Russia, not only the ruling elites, but also the professional elites, and to weaken the Putin system. And this is very important because going back to, to my conception of security, I think it is a very rich <clears throat> definition of security where uh, political um, problems inside a, a dictatorship are also very, very important to address. 
Thanks, Marie. Wolfgang, would you like to pick one or two questions? Um, uh, yes, I know we're running out of time. Uh, uh, let me be quite brutal at this moment, since we only have a minute or two. Um, the security architecture, which we had agreed and imagined uh, and thought to be stable, uh, uh, has failed. We allowed a European security architecture to exist where there were countries in between, in between, for example, Ukraine, for example, Georgia, for example, uh, Moldova. And it is exactly those countries that are now the origin um, and the object of, of, of uh, great power rivalries of, of, of war. So that's my, my first point. Our European security architecture has failed. We need to start from scratch. Second point, and even more important, <clears throat> deterrence has failed. Our view of deterrence uh, has been, and is as we speak, that we deter by punishing. We punish Russia. Uh, Marie, I will not repeat what Marie has just said about uh, sanctions. We try to punish Russia and try to have a deterrent effort. That has obviously, at least so far, totally failed. So what we need to do is be honest with ourselves and start to understand that deterrence will probably only work if we change from deterrence by punishment to deterrence by denial. Denial means we don't allow Russia next time around to take Moldova or Georgia or any uh, or the Baltics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That requires a huge effort, a huge military effort, and that takes us back to our point of departure. So I I think we need to be honest with ourselves. Our our concepts have failed; they are not working, and we're now paying a huge price for it. Good, uh, Wolfgang. Thank you for being so direct and uh, quick. And Sarah Guller, last word to you. Yes, I'm going to keep it short. I think Marie and Wolfgang have already gone into detail. I think many terms were already mentioned. So we talked about new threats, we talked about migration, misinformation, about climate. I believe that this goes to show that this war has many different dimensions. We talk about hybrid warfare, and these are all, these are the elements that are part of hybrid warfare. Just to pick up on what Mr. Ishinga said, deterrence needs to be just as multidimensional. We talked a lot about um, sanctions. In Germany right now, we're realizing that sanctions are not just harm, harming the ones that they're aiming at, but they're also harming the ones that are imposing sanctions. So I believe we need deterrence on different levels, just like war is led on different levels. So we need closer cooperation. We need to speak in one voice. We need to really embody all of our values. We should not just give speeches on our values. We should actually live our values. Um, Wolfgang Ischinger just talked about denying things, or, but I think we also need swift reactions. We need, maybe we have waited for too, or maybe we have talked for, for too long about sanctions. Maybe we have announced sanctions for too long so that the other side had really time to prepare for these sanctions. Russia is now going to have India as a partner where they can sell their gas too. So they had plenty of time to prepare for these sanctions. So if we were to act quicker, if we had acted quicker, it might have had an effect or an impact. So for the next steps that we're going to take, we need to take that into consideration. We need to have a more versatile approach because as I said, we have a very versatile war. This is just a comment and I would like to add to what's being said. 
Thank you so much, Sarah. I, well, I see a lot of convergence among the uh, various comments and remarks. But before we wrap up, I have a last question for you, and I ask you to reply really in one minute. Um, so we would like to know what is, in your opinion, one crucial initiative, one crucial project that France and Germany can put forward together in order to make progress in European security and defense. Uh, very short uh, setup. Would you like to start? Good. We have yeah, several projects. Well, we have several projects together with France. I just talked about one project, FCAS, for instance, or working on joint systems, for instance. I can just. Um, emphasize what Wolfgang Ischner just said, in order to succeed, we need the right political leadership. I'm not trying to bash companies, but we cannot leave this task up to the armament companies or arms companies. We need political leadership in order to make advances, in order to make clear how important this is for us. But it cannot just be a Franco-German project. I believe we need others that join us. And FKS also has Spain on board as a partner. But we have to go beyond that so that we can actually talk about a European security and defense policy. Very much agree. Please, Wolfgang, over to you. I have one very simple point, uh, adding to what uh, Zarab has just said. Um, Two years ago, Emmanuel Macron, in his speech, I think it was at the Ecole de Guerre, uh, talked about an offer to his partners, including, of course, Germany, to start discussing nuclear strategy. Um, he repeated this offer when he spoke a few weeks later at the Munich Security Conference. And I think to this day, my own government has not responded. Uh, we need a response. Uh, Emmanuel Macron deserves a response. And we need to start not a public, but a confidential discussion about how the French nuclear uh, asset can strengthen uh, European defense as a whole, can strengthen NATO's uh, uh, arrangements as a whole. The last time that was expressed publicly was in the Ottawa Declaration. That is half a century ago. So I think there is huge room for improvement here. And the nuclear question, given the Russian threats, the Russian threats with with nuclear, which are partially nuclear threats, uh, this is why this question is has now uh, acquired new urgency. And I really think that we owe uh, the French president an answer a response, a positive response to his offer. Thank you. Thanks, Wolfgang and Marie, please. We cannot hear you. You should unmute. No, Marie, still not. Yes. Yes. Now? OK. OK. Uh, yes, I fully agree with what Sarah and Wolfgang have said. Of course, the French and the Germans can and must do much better together, but they must do it not only um, with the objective of strengthening a Franco-German tandem. I think we are also beyond this, clearly, because we, we've just discussed the fact that security is not on the EU and it's not strictly limited to the borders of the EU because Ukraine is already part of the security, hence insecurity of the whole continent of Europe because the UK is out, but is also in when it comes to uh, European security and because of the uh, uh, Atlantic um, Alliance. So I would um, really uh, go for um, any project that brings a comprehensive discussion of security, which will replace the obsolete notion of strategic autonomy the war has made it obsolete, I think, uh, and also um, try to move beyond this un uncomfortable uh, line um, of um, misunderstanding and different positions between uh, Central Europe 
um, and uh, older Europe. I think this is the moment to do it and will be much stronger when uh, we you know, take on board on the very big questions of security and, and all aspects of security, all the member states, all the associate members, whether they are new, small, big, or that shouldn't matter. Thank you so much, Marie. So we uh, took a few more minutes than the time that was allotted to us. Anyway, I think that was a very rich, very intense discussion. Thanks to the speakers, Marie Mendras, Wolfgang Ischinger, and Serap Güler. And what remains to be said uh, is uh, in the conclusions by the president of the RT School, Cornelia Wool. So I give the floor to her directly for a few final remarks. Ja, vielen herzlichen Dank. Uh, wir kommen zum Ende. Thank you very much. So this is the end of today's event. As a concluding remark, I would like to thank everyone who made this event possible. So first of all, let me thank all of our panelists. Minister Clément Bonn, State Minister Anna Lührmann, State Secretary Franziska Brandner, all of the members of parliament. Thank you to all of the scientists. Thank you to all of the experts. Thank you to the audience in person as well as online. Thank you for enriching our discussion with your questions. The Franco-German exchange with the European outlook, this is what Europe needs right now. So we have seen right now that European cohesion and solidarity is more meaningful than ever for the capacity to act for all of our countries. We took a look at the economic, defense, and other dimensions, or economic dimensions, as well as other dimensions. And I'm very happy that Henrik Enderlein, or the, in the spirit of Henrik Enderlein, we managed to an analyze the European topics today. So now and in the future, we're going to be having this discussion under the auspices of his spirit. So we would like to continue these discussions in the future. So this is why I was so happy that we had actual recommendations for Franco-German projects for the future. So not just in theory, but also in practical terms, we got to see that the Franco-German projects facilitated this dialogue. And we have two universities that were facilitating our event, the Herti School and the Sciences Po. And I would like to especially thank Sciences Po. And as always, we had an excellent cooperation here in Berlin at the Jack Delors Center. Heidi Malin Breuer was responsible for the coordination of this event together with the center. They managed to successfully host this event. This was also facilitated by the generous support of the Federal Foreign Office, and I would like to thank the office for its trust in the Franco-German dialogue. So this way we managed to maintain this dialogue. So everyone who's here in person today, let me tell you, we have a small reception that we prepared for you. So let's meet again at the balcony for the final time, for the last time. Let's have a drink. And everyone who's who has tuned in tonight, let me tell you goodbye. See you next time. Thank you so much.